Welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue with Columbus in this lecture and talk about Columbus's maps. Again, this is a way of sort of getting inside his head uh, to see what the earth looked like to Christopher Columbus. I can assure you it looks nothing uh, like the earth that we know today. Uh, to get inside this mental world of Columbus, we're going to look at, uh, what do I have here, uh, five, six maps. The last one he did not see. We're going to use that to contrast with the previous five. Uh, the first one is uh, Ptolemy's map, and we'll provide images for you here. Uh, Ptolemy was an Egyptian. He lived in the first century of the Common Era. Egypt, of course, is part of the Roman Empire. So Ptolemy is an Egyptian and a Roman at the same time. Uh, a cartographer, uh, he created this map, uh, which is uh, quite beautiful. Uh, it's considered uh, authoritative. We know that it resurfaced by the time of Columbus, and we know that he uh, examined it. Let your eyes uh, uh, look over this map and try to get oriented to it. You can see in the, in the west, on the left, you can see the Mediterranean clearly. Uh, you can see Europe uh, north of the Mediterranean. You can see the African coast on the uh, south of the Mediterranean. Uh, Italy's quite clear, Spain. Um, you can see Greece. Uh, you can see the Black Sea and Turkey. You can see the Caspian Sea. Uh, the Arabian Peninsula is obvious. Uh, to its west, the Red Sea. And uh, to its east, the, uh, the Persian Gulf. You can even see uh, what looks like uh, the emerging horn of Africa, uh, where Ethiopia and Somalia are located. So as long as Ptolemy stays sort of around the Mediterranean basin, his map is reasonably accurate. But notice as you move away from the Mediterranean, if you go south into Africa, look what happens. Ptolemy takes the southern part of Africa and he wraps it around the map, forming a sort of decorative border, uh, connecting it up to Asia, connecting it with Asia, uh, sort of turning the Indian Ocean into a giant inland sea. Um, and then if you look uh, to the east, where China would be located, you see it's all guesswork. Uh, even India is uh, depicted here as a large island surrounded by a lot of small islands. And again, the Indies, uh, a collection of islands on the other side of the world. Uh, why, did Tol um, uh, why did Ptolemy run the southern portion of Africa around the border of this map? Well, for a simple reason, uh, Europeans and, uh, and the Egyptians did not know how far South Africa extended. Uh, no one had crossed the Cape of Good Hope. So this is pure guesswork. Uh, so Ptolemy made a, uh, a virtue out of his ignorance by using Southern Africa as a border to his map. Now, what I want you to pay particular attention to, the, to is this. You see Spain on the far western or left edge of this map. Look at that very narrow ocean sea to the west of Spain. Look what happens if you were to cross that by ship. You see where you end up? On the other side of the world, in China. Uh, visually, this is very compelling evidence that you could indeed cross the ocean quickly and safely and reach the Far East. Now, with Ptolemy's map in mind, let's look at a, a distinctly different type of map. This is a medieval church map. Uh, we call these TO maps. Uh, the T you see uh, surrounded by the O. The O, of course, is the uh, surrounding ocean of the earth. You see the Latin M-A-R-E at the top, uh, meaning ocean or sea. And then you see the interior T. This is uh, uh, generally depicted as uh, the Nile and the Don Rivers, and then the, uh, the stem of the T representing the Mediterranean. You see to the left of that stem, or to the north, uh, Europa, and then to the south, Africa. And you see Asia uh, dominant at the top portion of the map. Now, quite often where the, uh, where the T, the stem, and the cross intersect, you'll find uh, what's called the navel of the earth, and that is the city of Jerusalem, uh, the most holy site in Christendom. So this is a, a church map. Uh, this is a clerical map. Uh, it's not terribly interested in geographic accuracy. What it's interested in is uh, depicting uh, earth geography in Christian terms. Now, you'll notice that Asia has the dominant position at the top of this map. It's worth asking why. 
Uh, in Genesis, it's mentioned that uh, Eden is in the east. And of course, east of Europe is Asia. So it's assumed that paradise is located somewhere in Asia. So Asia is given the dominant position. Notice what else is detailed on this TO map. If you'll remember at the end of the, um, the story of Noah, uh, the floodwaters recede, Noah, uh, the ark comes to a rest, uh, the doors are open, the animals flee, the, uh, Noah's family emerges, and the land masses of the earth are apportioned to Noah's sons. You see Shem inherits Asia, uh, Japheth inherits Europa, and Ham, of course, inherits Africa. So uh, this is a map that was quite familiar to Europeans, uh, uh, church-going Europeans, and certainly Columbus was familiar with this. And you can see that although this is a clerical map as opposed to Ptolemy's very secular map, uh, you can see they tell Columbus the same thing, a very narrow ocean uh, surrounding the earth, uh, three continents, Africa, Europa, and Asia. Now, let's look at an, a, very, a very elaborate TO map. Uh, this is the Psalter map of 1250 of the Common Era. Again, a church map. You see Jesus at the top of the map here. Uh, you see the orb in, uh, in his hand. Uh, the, symbol, the symbolism here. Uh, does Jesus have your fate in his hands? Uh, you see the globe. And you see the narrow um, encircling ocean of the earth, the O. And then the T. Uh, again, the Mediterranean, the stem. And then the Nile and Don rivers uh, running... Um, perpendicular to the stem. So Europe is in the bottom left portion of this map, Africa in the bottom right, and then again the top portion of the map dominated by Asia. If you look at this Salter map on your own computer, you can use a uh, magnifying glass, and you can see Paradise at the very top uh, near Jesus. You see the four rivers emerging from Paradise. You see the Tower of Babel. Uh, essentially what this does is depict biblical scenes uh, in, a, in a sort of context of world history and geography. And again, I mentioned earlier that uh, Jerusalem is the navel of the earth, and you can see it here on this particular map. Um, look at the very center of the map, and you can see uh, Jerusalem. So again, uh, a clerical map that tells Columbus exactly what the T.O. map told him and uh, exactly what Ptolemy's map told him. Now, this is the Tuscanelli map. Uh, Tuscanelli is an Italian nobleman. He and Columbus exchanged letters. They passed this map back and forth, making comments about it. Uh, the Tuscanelli part is uh, the part here in sort of a beige color. Uh, the publishers of this particular map uh, went ahead and superimposed the actual Western Hemisphere on the map in white. So you can see what Columbus thought the world lo looked like uh, as opposed to what it actually looks like. Now, Columbus will leave uh, Spain and sail south um, to the Canaries uh, off the northwest coast of Africa. There he will refuel, uh, get fresh water, food, wine, olive oil, bread, and um, make repairs. And then he will catch the westerlies and uh, shoot across this narrow ocean. Uh, now, Columbus will land in these islands. Uh, you see a collection of uh, small islands. Uh, Columbus will uh, make landfall here and he knows exactly where he is. He's reached the Indies, and the Indies, of course, a large collection of islands on the other side of the world. Um, after tooling around these islands, he heads southwest, and he encounters a very long island that he tries to circumnavigate. Uh, it's so long that he finally gives up the attempt and turns back, but he knows exactly where he is. Uh, this is the island of Sepango, and he's read about this in Polo's book. Now, Sepango uh, is synonymous with Japan. So Columbus believes that he has reached Japan. And according to Polo's book, Japan lies just east of China. So having reached Japan, uh, Columbus knows that just over the Western, uh, over the Western uh, horizon lies the land of the Great Khan, uh, China. So he has no doubt of where he is. Now, we can look at this map and see that Columbus has made a rather dramatic geographic mistake. Uh, Sepango, of course, is um, what he believes uh, Sepango is not Japan at all. 
Uh, it's the island of Cuba, uh, a long, narrow island. It would take uh, quite a, an effort to circumnavigate. Uh, the Indies that Columbus had reached first, of course, are the Bahamas, not the Indies. So this map um, demonstrates in dramatic fashion uh, the way the world actually is and the way Columbus believed it to be. Now, let's look at, uh, let's look at this next map. This was published, I believe, in 1490, so this is only two years before Columbus sailed. Uh, this is the Martellus world map. Uh, again, a, a, a strikingly beautiful map. You can see the, uh, uh, you can see one uh, geographic improvement. Um, look at the southern tip of Africa. Uh, the Cape of Good Hope has been discovered. It's been crossed by the Portuguese explorer Diaz, uh, I believe in 1488. That information's made its way back to the cartographer, and he's included it on this map. He still runs Africa off the borders, but nevertheless, we, you can see the ocean uh, entirely around the southern tip of Africa. Otherwise, this map is very similar to the other ones, isn't it? Uh, a narrow ocean surrounding the Earth, only three continents. Africa, Asia, and Europa. Uh, you see again, as long as we stay in the Mediterranean basin, that this map is reasonably accurate. Uh, look at Italy and Spain and uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, the North African uh, shore, the Red Sea, the Black Sea. It looks reasonably accurate as long as we stay there, but go uh, eastward toward China and you'll see that it becomes entirely uh, a matter of guesswork. But it uh, reaffirms what Columbus already knows, a uh, very narrow ocean separating Spain from China. Now, let's look at this last map. Columbus never saw this map. In fact, I believe it was published the year he uh, died, in 1507, I believe. Uh, this is the Martin Walsemuller's uh, world map of 1507. Uh, Walsemuller, a German cartographer, um, and you can see that this is uh, dramatically different from the other maps we've looked at. Uh, you see Africa, you know, the Cape of Good Hope depicted here with the, uh, the watery uh, borders of South Africa. Uh, you can see uh, an emerging Pacific Ocean on the right. You can see for the first time the Western Hemisphere depicted on a map. Uh, a small North America there in the top left corner and then a much larger South America extending southward. Uh, notice the two men at the top of the map. On the left you have Ptolemy and you can see that he's gazing back to the old world, that part of the world that he had mapped. Look on the right, you see the, the European gazing at the new world. Uh, I've asked students this many times, who do they think this is? And most, most students will say Columbus. And of course it isn't. This is another Italian explorer, Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, Vespucci had sailed to the New World in the decade uh, following Columbus and he had sailed down the Brazilian coast of, of what we think of as South America and he encountered something so astonishing that he realized that this could not be an island, that Columbus had not uh, found the Indies, that indeed he had found uh, a new continent. Uh, what Vespucci saw of course was the mouth of the Amazon. Uh, the Amazon, the world's largest river, uh, uh, Vespucci took a look at it and realized that no island uh, could support a river this size. This had to be a continent uh, from which this uh, vast waterway was born. Uh, this information, uh, Vespucci's information, made its way back to Europe and Martin Volsimuller, the cartographer, uh, uh, used this information in, uh, in this depiction of the world. And he labeled that new landmass to the west, uh, the new world, he labeled it uh, Amerigo in honor of Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, it was quickly feminized, this name, uh, to America. And uh, you can imagine Columbus is probably still spinning in his grave. Nevertheless, you can see uh, that the, the world as we know it is beginning to emerge here uh, in this map of 1507. So when I ask you the significance of these maps, it should be obvious to you that, uh, and again, discount the Waldseemuller map because Columbus never saw it and would not have believed it if he had seen it. Uh, understand that these maps all convince Columbus, whether they're clerical or secular in nature, 
that he can sell from Spain to China quickly and safely. Uh, there's no intervening Western Hemisphere. Uh, there's no Pacific Ocean to cross. Uh, so that's why these maps are significant. Now, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Columbian Exchange, uh, the sort of decisive breaking point uh, in history, uh, the point at which we begin to globalize, uh, the point at which we begin to uh, be propelled into the modern era. Uh, so thank you for your attention.